Good. I think maybe we can get started. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Francesca Bregoli. I am the director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you for our fourth and last public talk of the full semester, uh, a presentation by Professor Federica Francesconi uh, on her new book, Invisible Enlighteners, The Jewish Merchants of Modena from the Renaissance to the Emancipation that is out now with pen press. And here is the book. And um, there is a code, a uh, discount code that I will put in the chat momentarily. It's such a pleasure to welcome Professor Francesconi to this online space. She's a dear friend and colleague. She's a fellow Emilian uh, from Bologna. And I should insert a joke here about the fact that she's from Bologna and writes so well about people from Modena, but I think only the Italians in the Zoom room <laughs> will actually appreciate the joke. Um, I wish we could welcome you all in person at the Graduate Center in Midtown Manhattan, but although we're not in the same physical room, at least Zoom allows us to reach out to many more of you, especially if you are outside of New York. I see that some of you are in, in, in Europe. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on this Friday. Some of you are longtime friends of the Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Center, but some of you may be new. And if you would like to receive more information about our activities in the spring, upcoming events, please email us so that we can add you to our mailing list. I will make sure to put all contact information in the chat box um, in, a, in a moment. This program will last 90 minutes. We will start with a presentation by Professor Francesconi followed by a conversation uh, between the two of us to explore some of the themes of the book. We will leave plenty of time for all your questions. If you have a question, please feel free to type the word question in the chat box or use the hand raise function. Uh, I will make sure to unmute you in the order that we receive. If you're unable to unmute yourself, please type out, type out your question in the chat so that it can be read out loud. And let me finally remind you to keep, please keep yourself muted during the event, which is being recorded as you see, and will later be uploaded to the center's YouTube channel. And now without further ado, let me introduce our presenter. Uh, Federica Francesconi is assistant professor, can I say soon to be associate professor of history and director of the Judaic studies program at the University of Albany, SUNY. She is the author of Invisible Enlighteners, The Jewish Merchants of Modena from the Renaissance to the Emancipation, uh, which is, was published by Penn Press in 2021, and the co-editor of From Catalonia to the Caribbean, The Sephardi Orbit from Medieval to Modern Times, and very recently out, Gender and Jewish Women in Historical Perspective. Her current book project is tentatively entitled The Jewish Home in Early Modern Venice, Cosmopolitan Intimacy, global networks and diasporic material culture. Uh, Francesconi is also associate editor and book review editor of the Journal of Jewish History and one of the co-founders of the New York State Working Group on Jewish Women's History from Antiquity to the Present. This is a spectacular book um, and we're really looking forward to your presentation, Federica. Federica, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you for uh, this warm introduction and it's uh, such an honor to present uh, my book today here. And uh, you are one of the colleagues and the person and the people I admire the most. So that is a great opportunity and I'm looking forward to the conversation between us. I also want to thank the Center for Jew Studies and the History PhD program at the Graduate Center of CUNY for um, sponsoring this event. And I want also to thank all of you for being here and many of you inspired my scholarship in a tremendous way. I want to thank the University of Pennsylvania Press and Shaul Magid, Francesca Trevellato and Steve Weisman for welcoming my book in their series, Jewish Culture and Context. And a special thank to my editor at Penn Press, Jerry Singerman, who founded the series with David Ruderman and took care of my book at any stage. I'm going to, um, and thank you also for being here at this moment of the semester, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen and, uh, sorry for that. Yeah. 
I just want to start with a, 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 an image from Modena in the 17th century. And for those of you who don't think that Italy is the center of the world and Modena in particular is the center of everything, here the map. Uh, Modena was uh, during the 17th and 18th century through uh, the second half of the 19th century, the capital of uh, an independent sta state uh, in uh, Italy, um, the Est Duchy. And here you see some images of the uh, main square and the Duomo in Modena, and here some images that can good a good that can give you a good sense of Modena and its past through various views of the cities of the city from the 1740s to the 1770s. So it's a series of local paintings by unknown artists. And here, what we see is the city itself as the major, the major subject. That, and according to historians, to art historians, the paintings were intended as an expression of civic pride, a composite portrait of the city after the monumental re renovation of the, the mid of the 17th century. These were meant to represent the city at work, ladies, gentlemen, priests, soldiers, work, workers, vendors, and beggars are all present. Jews and their ghetto are not represented. Therefore, if we examine these city views more closely, we realize that while Jews were virtually absent, Jewish merchants' buildings were everywhere. During the 18th century, silversmiths and jewelers, such as uh, the Modenas, Levis, and Formigenes, opened shops in the main centers of the city, while the textile mills of other Jewish merchants, such as Dottis, Usilios, and Rovigos, were scattered around, near the, the gates of Modena. At the same time, they were all forced to reside in a small ghetto in the center of the city. Here you see the area of the ghetto, here the main square, the city hall, and the, the Ducal Palace. And here the uh, entrance of the ghetto and the view of the ghetto nowadays. Here is the area with the monumental synagogue of Modena that was uh, erected in 1873. And here an image from the beginning of the, 19th of the 20th century. And here the original block of the ghetto. Of, um, of the and here a map from from the from the um, um, that shows the location of the ghetto, the center of the city, and the construction of of a small square in the middle. This uh, ghetto was uh, uh, in the city, in this capital city, the only social, ethical, uh, uh, the, the only socially, ethnically, and culturally diverse neighborhood in the city where both poor and wealthy of different ethnicity who spoke, read a different kind, different uh, a variety of languages, practiced different customs and rituals, and pursued different educational systems and cultural systems. Um, lived in close proximity to each other and shared spaces in the same tenements. In mid 17th century, the Ghetto Society of Modena was a composite group that included the new arrival from Hamburg, Amsterdam, Livorno, Venice, and Constantinople. My book tells the story of the Modenese Jewish merchants who lived and prospered under the Est Dukes during the 17th and 18th centuries, and, may be, and they may be said to constitute the backbone of the wider history of early modern Italian and ultimately European Jewish history. The Modenese Jewish history elite enacted a process of social cultural transformation and legal and political integration that evolved in the 17th and 18th century through a complex dialogue with Jewish identity without suffering the traumatic ruptures or dramatic divides that sometimes led to assimilation and conversion elsewhere. Modernist Jewish merchants, while absent from the public discourse of the Estes, lived in a social cultural environment that gave rise to unique forms of Renaissance culture, early modern female agency, and the Enlightenment practice that stand out within the Italian and the European context for its importance. 
a lot, um, 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 this just to give a sense of uh, um, Renaissance culture that was shaped by merchants and not only by intellectuals. Uh, um, there is a plethora of sources that I discovered uh, that show men and women were hiding their books from Boccaccio and Dante in their closet or in their bedrooms. Um, um, devout Kabbalists were immersing themselves in the mercantile activities and in shaping a new kind of poetry connected to the Baroque ideals of Italian uh, um, um, poetry of the time. Women who refused to to all the candles during the childbirth, but they insisted to keep a, the Torah scroll during this moment, and they wanted to recite prayers with other women and midwives in the moment of childbirth. And lastly, we see also this network of Jewish merchants who imported with Jesuits during the second half of the 18th century books that are an encyclopedia of the Enlightenment in general, oriented to a to or the French culture, who then they were able to shape their own kind of Jewish Enlightenment, looking at a French lay culture rather than the Prussian Ascala, and on the other became the leaders of a Italian and Jewry in general with the arrival of Napoleon in 1796. So this, uh, uh, this book tells uh, the social and political history of these merchants and I traced uh, their settlement, utilization and emancipation and uh, I explored the means by which they established a network of, of upper middle class Jewish families and maintain their role as community leaders through business, interfamilial alliances, and the production of religious and secular culture over the course of, of more than two centuries. It begins with the election of Modena as the capital of the Estedaci in 1598, and the subsequent immigration of more Jews from Ferrara, the original capital in the city. It ends in 1796 with the um, establishment under Napoleon of the Cispadene Republic and the beginning of the so-called first Italian Jewish emancipation. The early modern period in Jewish history has no firmly established chronological boundaries. Most broadly defined, it covers the period between the 15th and the long 18th century, through some, though some historians place its end as late as 1815. I consider the Iberian expulsion and the French revolutions as the points that frame early modern Italian Jewish, Jewish history on each side. In Modena, the transformation brought about the Iberian and other Jewish expulsion immigrations emerged most visibly in the early 16th century, with the demographic and ethnic transformation of the local Jewish community. While the challenges of the French Revolution became more evident what, with the 1796 occupation led by Napoleon, when the ideals of the revolution effectively cha changed Jewish political participation, as well as the practices of the daily life. In a recent study on a group of Sephardi merchants in 17th and 18th century Livorno, Francesca Trivellato has coined the expression communitarian cosmopolitanism to capture, and I quote, the experience of Sephardic merchants who in Livorno as elsewhere synthesized multiple traditions and mingled with non-Jews, but did so within the framework of corporatist society of unequal separate groups. The form of communitarian cosmopolitanism changed from place to place, but everywhere they sought to contain fluidity and regulate the interaction between Jews and Christians." End of quote. Modernist Jews were subjected to the restrictions described by Trivellato, but by January 1638, they had also permanently ghettoized. And modernist Jewish merchants confronted the ghettoization as well as the political and legal impacts of the state and the Catholic Church, which affected all Italian Jews with the exception of those in Livorno. In analyzing their stories, Invisible Enlighteners attempts at bridging Europe and the Mediterranean in the early modern period, bringing into dialogue different historiographical paradigm that have recently emerged within early modern Jewish history and general early modern history. 
Here, I wanted to mention two of these paradigms that have been particularly influential in my work. First, David Ruderman's pioneering study of Jewish history in the early modern era in Western and Eastern Europe and the Ottoman Empire, considering five factors. An accelerated mobility that produced unprecedented contact, not only between Jews and other Jews, but also between Jews and non-Jews. A growing communal cohesiveness, an explosion of knowledge and circulation of sources that highly was, impacted, was highly impacted by the invention of printing, a crisis of rabbinical authority often expressed in active messianism, myst mystical prophecy, individual enthousi enthusiasm, and heresy. And the bl blurring of religious identities due in particular to the presence of influence of the conversos. The existence of a Jewish mercantile elite in Modena, and David Ruderman is a, an historian on, from a cultural and intellectual perspective, and I come from a social history perspective, so I found quite intriguing, complementing, attempting to complement his work with my own. So what we see is a sort of confirmation and complication of those categories. For example, accelerated mobility in early modern Modena was characterized not only by the influx of Sephardi families in mid 17th century, but also the presence of itinerant scholars in houses and yeshivot of Aron Berechia Modena and Abraham Rovigo, both rabbis, scholars, and merchants who transformed the city in, and the Jewish community is a centripetal and, centri and centrifugal center for Kabbalah and Sabbatianism. Yet the, the number of conversions in 17th century Modena was not high enough to impact or substantially challenge the Jewish society. Their amalgamation into Italian Judaism was more fluid than frightening. Finally, this book, this book I think, complements Ruderman's study, adding not only the history of Jewish women per se, but also the narrative of early modern Jewish history through the prism of, of gender as category of interpretation. The second um, historical framework I want to bring into the conversation that I think complement quite well also, and is in dialogue in a way with Ruderman's assessment, is Nicola Sterb's new approach to the to new approach to the Reformation by studying European communities of exile and migrant refugees. Terstra is a social historian, has worked mainly on Italy, and he has reshaped the history of the early modern age in Europe by attributing more, much more significance to the 1492 expulsion from Spain than to the beginning of Martin Luther Reformation. This expulsion, Terpsa emphasized, was the first attempt to purify an entire country of unbelievers and to and purge it from heresy. Beginning in 1492, forced expulsion reshaped U Europe's social geography as communities of refugees were on the move throughout European regions. Just to think, think about Dutch Anabaptists or Italian Calvinists or, or English Catholics. Those were forcibly removed from their places or, were, uh, or voluntarily decided to leave. They often constituted new communities that in a way conformed and recreated, according to Tebs, the same principles of cohesiveness, purification, and purgation that had characterized the communities within which they had been marginalized or expelled. At the turn of the 16th century, the modernist Jewish community was a Mediterranean and European society of refugees that was part, partially exclusive because of religious tenet and ethnic boundaries, as well as theological discrimination, legal constraint, and popular hatred. Yet it was never governed by principle of purification and purgation. And also another consequence that we can see looking at the city and this idea of external and internal internal exiles that Turks are traced is that the enclosure in Modena of co communities of, prostitution, of prostitutes and the, and the sick that anticipated the, 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 the ghettoization of Jews in 1638 that surely reshaped the social fabric of Modena. Nevertheless, the Duke never embracing the kind of violent public language of purification and pol pollution that characterized as, as other cities such as Barcelona, Frankfurt, and Rome, where the, the local clergy were more powerful. So each of my chapters are employs what to use uh, the, the 
terminology of the Italian microhistorian Eduardo Gringhi, exceptional archival evidence, meaning ex documents that are out of the ordinary, that if properly read, interpreted, and contextualized in light of other documentation, do not simply tell exceptional stories, but also illuminate broad historical trends and microhistorical phenomena. In the time I have at my disposal, in these few minutes, I would just like to take you to the early modern Jewish ghetto modern and present a couple of micro stories, micro histories that can help us populate history with real people and address some of the main themes of my book, Renaissance culture and early modern female agency. Let's start with the first story. A Moise Modena, and uh, has uh, just to complicate the situation, uh, <laughs> as it was custom of the, Jew, of the of Jews in Italy at the time, they were taking their names often from the family names from the from the places in which they had established their residence. So Moise Modena was from Modena. In uh, <laughs> in, in, in February 1600, two years after Modena had become the capital of the state, and the Inquisition was brought to full inquisitorial status. Moise was tried by the, by the local inquisitor for owning forbidden or unexpurgated books. So he had a series of attempts to, con, to hide the list of his books. He always back, he went for a week back and forth from his house to the uh, inquisition, uh, to the holy office, uh, and he basically made attempts to conceal the list of his book and then he had to surrender. And interestingly, he was tried for having a, not Hebrew books. So he, there is also the list of course that you can see here, but for a, a Bible in the vernacular in Spanish, the De Vanitate by Cornelio Agrippa in Italian, a book by Raymond Lull and a Boccaccio's De Cameron. Um, what is interesting here is that I look at 200 different trials, 95 lists, and this is uh, it, the only list I think that mirror the uh, uh, real um, library of a uh, um, it, exactly because at, at the real library at the time, because it, the, the owner was really forced to show all his books. This impressive library consists mostly, mostly of Hebrew, Italian, Latin books, range from Rashi, by biblical commentary, to the Sefer Akutari and the Meore Naim, from Petras to Marsilio Ficino's works. So we have a sort of a mm, complex encyclopedia of culture here, legal codes, Hebrew grammars, medical codes, Midrashim, Kabbalistic literature, Italian and Latin literature, rhetoric, medicine, and philosophy. Moise was neither a rabbi nor a famous scholar or a physician, but a wealthy and cultured banker and merchant. He was the cousin of the famous Leone Modena. He, one of his son was the celebrated Kabbalist Aron Berechia, 1578-1639, who already has started to um, diffuse Lurianic and Cordoverian Kabbalah in Modena and elsewhere in Northern Italy. So what we know also is that uh, a modern synagogue and school were the center of cultural and religious life for cities, Italian Jews. There were others, but I stop on this, on this one in particular. And also I, I just want to emphasize that how in this context, Jewish lives were also dramatically affected since the second half of the 16th century by conversionary uh, efforts initiated by Paul IV, counter-reformation policies, and uh, uh, that targeted also Jews. Uh, the Talmud was publicly burned in 1553, and it was uh, permanently banned in 1596. With the Paul Communivis Absurdum in 1555, there was the creation of the Roman ghetto, the restriction of Jewish economic activities and property ownership in the Papal state. And ultimately, this ball, this uh, led to the establishment of the ghettos throughout the Italian peninsula, as well as local expulsions. The banning of the town surely affected Jewish readings. Moreover, due to the fact that the Catholic clergy considered Modena one of the most dangerous Italian heretical centers, also for the presence of the of a reform Christian heterodox movements, both Jews and Christians experienced a strict surveillance of forbidden 
um, or suspicious non-Hebrew books, often also in the vernacular. Um, what we see also that at this point, uh, modern, the, the, the family of Moise Modena and other merchants are basically the target of the Inquisition and they constitute a sort of shared leadership in order to deal and to face uh, um, the um, constraint and the attacks by the Inquisition and the request of the ghettoization from many uh, body of the, bodies of the society. Mosey Modena's library mirrored his eclectic personality, again, characterized by a combination of culture and commerce. And in this case, the sources allows us to explore the intellectual sphere of Jewish merchants, of a Jewish merchant who did not leave any self-written work. Through his library though, not only the intelligentsia, but also the Jewish merchant class participated in the wider culture of Italian society at the time. They belonged to modern synagogue and they were given the opportunity to benefit from the connected library. In my book, I also trace the start at the start of the 17th century, a general process of the masculinization of the Jewish society that involved attempts at limiting women's access to secular culture by urging them toward a cloistered sort of a bibliotheca selecta. For example, women were encouraged to read the translation into Italian of Shlonik's Seder Mitzvot Nashim, printed, printed in Padua in 1626, rather than Boccaccio's Decameron and Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. New forms of Jewish piety and counter-reformation influences along with the mercantile elite's need for social control had determined the change within Jewish society and attempts to restrict women's role in the synagogue and exclusion from festive, festive traditional events. Yet, in so doing, rabbis such as Aron Berechia Modena conceived also new options for women, insertion of new devotional prayers and Kabbalistic rituals they were included while Berechia Modena and other rabbis in the city were reimagining Jewish women in the domestic sphere. So this kind of complexity, I think, of how, how rabbis at this time were reconfiguring the space of women is some often neglected or underestimated by Jewish and general historians. Yet in modern, in modernist Jewish merchants homes and house building, women were present in spaces that could otherwise be perceived as exclusively in the male sphere. Issues of gender and space were more complex than was often assumed, and more importantly, a strict separation between the public and domestic spaces never actually occurred. Just to give an example, to keep, to keep our attention on book culture and Renaissance culture, in 1636, a 35-year-old Allegra Carmi Poggetti, the wife of a local and quite known rabbi, a mother of three older, uh, three toddlers, was discovered by the Inquisition, by the Inquisitor, in possession of a number of books, Boccaccio's the Genealogia degli Dei. Andreini Mirtilla, Ovid's Metamorphosis, and Dante's Divine, Divine Comedy that she was uh, keeping, and it, she was keeping this book secretly in, her, in the closet of her bedroom. Allegra, Allegra Boccetti book, books allow for a broader understanding of Jewish readership and general culture by including long silence women in the dual gender space of, of the house. For women, this is my point, is the emphasis was more on Renaissance culture than Jewish subjects, limited in their access to Kabbalah, to Hebrew Bible, and biblical commentaries and Talmudic treatises, upper middle class uh, and middle class Jewish women, such as Allegra Borgetti and many others, reconfigured their intellectual world to center on poetry, literature, and music with Jewish and secular subjects. So let me just wrap up very briefly. Moise Modena's micro, eh, 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 micro history and trying to expand on a macro level. Um, a few, some years ago, David Rudolph, for example, has emphasized how the cultural formation of Italian and in general European Jewish authors was based primarily on disciplines such as Kabbalah, rhetoric, historiography, scholastic and Neoplatonic philosophy, magic, medicine, and the science, as well as music. 
So what is for me was interesting here is see how Ruderman's idea of this, what he called a open, the open book within Jewish culture was shared not only by outstanding intellectuals, but also by teachers, rabbis, merchants, bankers, both men and women. And it's not just that, it's also the fact that Jewish merchants were shaping those readings. Um, moreover, instead of uh, looking at uh, a, a, um, this general culture in general, it, this, this, this Renaissance culture in general, I would say also that instead of culturating in the sense of progressing toward modernity, that is sometimes often emphasized while talking about Italian Jews, the Jewish milieu of Moise Modena underwent the process of cultural hybridization. For modernist Jews, cultural hybridity also meant culturally intimate communion, not only knowing and interiorizing the Italian language in its multiple nuances, but also mastering the same literature and culture of their Christian neighbors. At the same time, theological boundaries remained neat. My conceptualization of both cultural hybridization and hybridity responds to Peter Burke, who elaborated and brought this definition in two Renaissance studies and early modern history. Jews in Italy did not submit to cultural colonization that is sometimes a, a criticism that is made to cultural, to the use of cultural hybridity. Here we see Italian and Hebrew cultures were in the eyes of Italian and modernist Jews equal and agency and intention were often included in the process. In modern Jewish versions, both men and women shape this cultural world without, again, traumatic contrast or, or tensions. Let me go just briefly to uh, the last microhistory, Miriam Rovigo's, uh, who was born in 1700. She died in 1778, and she was a female member of this mercantile elite, the grand uh, uh, daughter of Abraham Rovigo, uh, an illustrious Kabbalist and um, representative of uh, Sabbatianism in Italy. In 1735, she was the, the main founder of the first female Hevra in Europe, so had Holim, to benefit the sick, for which we have a complete pinkas, a complete register. And this document is for me a document that is in a way out of normal, but reveals a lot of common trends that we can find in this society. Um, as, uh, what, we, what we see here is that I contextualize this document with various sources, testaments, dowries, records, and financial transactions, and records from the Jewish courts in Modena. So what we see here is that we, in, the, in this process of masculinization of the public domain in the Jewish society, Jewish women always also, they were shut out of the Hevrot in the ghetto. Yet in the same, in the same years, Yet in the same years, what we see is a, a, a series of negotiation in the Jewish house that makes possible the, for, the transformation of, um, the formation of new forms of devotion, both domestic and public. And we see Jewish women adopting Hines, invoking the matriarchs in Italian and Hebrew, as well as special rituals in the houses during childbirth, such as Torah scroll with the assistance of midwives and other women, and new Hanukkah lamps with a female heroine Judith as a protagonist and on the wells, on the walls of mercantile houses. So indeed, women also regained voices in, the, uh, um, in philanthropy. In November 1735, a group of uh, Jewish women, inspired by the famous verse, Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself, founded this sisterhood in a room of Miriam Rovigo's house in the, in the ghetto. And by doing so, they were making a, a, they were making a fundamental stand. Uh, all the other uh, founders were really similar in terms of background to Miriam's uh, and his wife and his, and his mother, Grazia. They were wives and daughters of most influential families in the, mod in the modern Jewish community. And their aim was to help and assist all sick women, rich and poor, in the ghetto. 
A upper middle class Jewish women in 18th century modern appeared to have been almost silent member of the Jewish community, instrumental mainly in forging important social and political alliances among the Italian Jewish mercantile elites for the reallocation and transfer of estates. These women did not take part in family business activities and as widows, they transferred control of their dowries to their sons, in part Miriam as a widow was a little bit different because she kept a, a, a control on some of her properties. In 1735, the Sohet Kolimpikas emphasized her role as the first inspiring and inspired woman who took initiative to establish the Sohet Kolim in her house with all the other women aimed at performing the mitzvot, the Jewish presence. At the time, Miriam was an affluent widow, the daughter of Lustro, who had married, and she had married her uncle, Raffaele Rovigo. The family had already a number of activities, bank shops, apartments, large houses in, in the ghettos, a, a powered silk mill in the city, and villas and farms in the countryside. The Rovigo house has become, become also since the second half of the 17th century, one of the most interesting Sabbatean centers in the Mediterranean. And the, the Rovigos frequently hosted and funded scholars, emissaries from the land of Israel, Sabbatean exponents, physicians and healers, some specialized in treating hysterical women who shaped new forms of devotional religiosity. In this way, the Rovigo were able to combine their in, in, involvement in the Sabbatean movement with their philanthropic leanings. So there was a form of a, a moderate Sabbateanism. And uh, here you see, we see Grazia and uh, um, Miriam and, and, and Miriam Rovigo immersed in this kind of atmosphere. And also their attempt in a way to include rituals in the synagogue, in the confraternity uh, that were expanding the focus of the confraternity bis, beyond the, the um, um, assistance of the other Sikh women. For example, uh, um, celebration of a donation of dowries for a young girl or um, the uh, celebration of Rosh Kodesh with all women together. So these were of particular significance event. And what we see also that these, uh, basically what women were not able to do in their own family, they were able to do through this confraternity. Issuing lo loans, invested in bonds and property, using, uh, using collective profits for their activities. So the Sohet Kolim also um, uh, helped in uh, easing the condition in the ghetto, struggling against the, in, 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 um, the um, attempts of forced conversion of conversion by the neophyte house. And at the same time, they did not, um, they did not subvert the balance in the, in the modernist Jewish society and they respected, they, they presented themselves as a, a pious community of women aimed at philanthropic activities. Indeed, what we can do here is how actually through, with, through fraternalism, these women challenge their marginalization. And uh, uh, through this kind of organization they had that was gathering in the same house where the Sabbatianism movement was, 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 was uh, were meeting. The only difference is that, that they were meeting during the day while the men were, were uh, meeting during the night. In any case, we have an idea of what constituted in the 18th century a feminine autonomous and independent space. Here also, what I think we can see is uh, um, how the, this case of modernist Jewish elite women complicates the concept of neatly separate spheres by demonstrating, demonstrating a slow profits, prof, process of redefinition of femininity in both the domestic and the public spaces that shifted over more than two centuries. Their exclusion pro from professional activities and religious domains in the early 17th century was not followed by a co passive confinement to the domestic sphere. They created a new collective professional, social, and religious opportunities, and ultimately moved to a new religious sphere, establishing at the end of the century an independent female synagogue. 
in Sulu, they partnered with Jewish men in the transformation of the mercantile Jewish elite and his leadership in the modernist ghetto. Thank you. Thank you so much, Federica, for this. Uh, for this presentation and you're teasing out some of the uh, some of the key elements from your book um i i really enjoyed reading your book i think it's such a such a meticulous careful and and vivid reconstruction of the mercantile jewish society modena and i i am from modena i don't know if that was clear from my comment at the beginning of of the of the event uh but it was it was just so um both moving and and intellectually uh, uh, exciting to read your book and to be transported to the 17th and 18th century society of these merchants, both men and women that you reconstruct so well. Um, and um, I, I have many questions on your book. So um, I'm going to start with the first one, which is about ghettos, right? This, these Jews are living in a ghetto that gets established in 1638. And I think it's safe to say that the American public is best acquainted with the ghettos of Venice, of Rome and Florence and their characteristics, but you introduce the ghetto of Modena to the mix. And you also emphasize the uniqueness of the, the, the modernist situation. So my question is, what's your take? on the position of Modena in the larger constellation of the Italian ghettos and how do you understand its uniqueness? And, and does the Modenese story change or confirm what we know about Jewish life in the age of the ghettos? Yeah, Francesca, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, your, for your question. And I think that um, if we look at, um, the ghetto societies in general, for sure, uh, and we consider Modena as a capital city in a way, a marginalized um, um, place in the la landscape of all the attention by general historians or Jewish historians on um, um, Venice, Rome, Florence. And actually for me, the most interesting aspect was on the one hand discovering a world that never nobody had always ever documented and on the other also looking at some um, figures in intellectual history such as Abraham Yagel that were um, investigated and studied in the um, in, in the framework of intellectual cultural history and or Aron Berchia Modena as well, and then actually reconstructing their, uh, their cultural world and looking at how, actually how this, this uh, society of merchants shaped also their uh, culture. But what I would say is that uh, um, what I see that is the core of Modena is uh, First of all, the possibility of studying and the presence of a stable, a, even if not oligarchic elite, because in any case, this society was, this elite was permeable. But Jews, merch, Jewish merchants in Modena invested in the city. While we see, for example, in Venice, these incredible networks of Jewish merchants that often they were staying only for a few decades. And they were, of course, cosmopolitans. Here, what is interesting in seeing a Jewish merchants who become modernists in the way with all of the um, different aspects and layered levels of this kind of negotiation uh, that they had to carry out uh, in um, um, constantly. What we see, though, is also, I would say, that, so what we learn, of, for example, if we, if we look at the community in Rome, thoroughly uh, uh, thoroughly studied by Kenneth, so we see different kind of community. It was more a lower level class of community, and uh, um, he and, and we don't see that there, for example, some elements of Renaissance culture that was so shared at the level of uh, the, mercant the mercantile and the general society in Italy. So what I think that we could look at is uh, um, in terms of how to change, how we can change our perspective. The idea, I think that many elements that I traced in Modena that were made 
make Modena unique because all of them were together. And the Kabbalists and the, and the merchants and the Sabatia movement and the Renaissance culture and the female agency and the, the enlightenment practices. So for example, I would say that this idea of women who were negotiating their, their spaces is unique because we, we can find sources in Modena, but we can see different elements in other contexts as well. Uh, or, for example, the idea that perhaps we don't really need an authentic public sphere in order to generate an authentic enlightenment. And that is exactly what happened in, in, um, in, the, Jewish, um, in the Jewish community of Modena. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pick up on one of the, the things that you were mentioning uh, at the beginning of your answer, uh, which is, you know, it, one of the important points that you make in your in your work is that Jews are crucial for the economic survival of the Estedachi because they're the only truly productive entrepreneurial group in Modena. But at the same time, their role is strategically erased and Jews uh, are made invisible by the Est authorities through ghettoization um, so that the Christian social and political body is not undermined and the ongoing trust of the Christian population can be maintained. So I, I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about this key tension in Modena, right? Is there also any way to reconstruct the way that Jews felt about their invisibility and how and if these perceptions change over time, uh, particularly as we get towards the 18th century? No, uh, thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Also for highlighting one of the elements of uniqueness is for sure, on the one hand, the fact that uh, Jewish merchants in modern India were not competing with other merchants because they were the merchants. And at the same time, though, there were issues in the Estedachi in order to keep the balance, particularly with um, citizens and people in the uh, in landed properties, etc. So uh, Jews were erased from the public discourse. They, even in legal codes, even if when they were running basically the economy, the monopolies, they were not even mentioned. Um, another, um, that is, uh, and on the other side, unique in the sense that uh, they were not competing and they were capable, able to enroll in, in all the guilds. Well, actually, so we have merchants everywhere, of course, but here is a particular situation in this, in this aspect. In terms of visibility and invisibility, I think that at the end, when you're mentioning the 18th century is, is, is really an apt way to look at, because there are moments where um, you, you perceive that there is a tension in being invisible even before the 18th century. So the moment in which the ghetto is imposed in the 1620s through the 1636, Jewish lay leaders, merchants really attempt to fight this imposition. And, uh, um, and, this, is, and this is a reflection of how they were they felt about the ghettoization that was uh, aimed at isolating them in the city. And they were quite aware of that. On the other aspect, there are moments in which they are going, they accept this kind of invisibility. For example, when they have to, during the, the um, often they had to hide the ghetto during the Holy Week. So the ghetto is useful in order to um, show this, the, the city and the state that Jews are ghettoized. But in some moments, uh, uh, the ghetto also has to disappear and is often the Holy Week. At the same time, Jews were everywhere. So their, their shops, uh, their small booths, they were everywhere in the city. What I would say that you see, the tension is when at, the, um, when at a certain point there is uh, um, the arrival, for example, of Napoleon in 1796 and Jews start being visible and Jews want to be visible. And the only moment in which there is a real tension between a, a Jews and their Christian neighbors is when in 1797, French authorities propose dismantling the ghetto. And that becomes a sort of crisis in the city and in this balance. Uh, that at the same time though reflected the fact that this crystallized society 
uh, was going to an end. And at the same time, being invisible, having this sort of laboratory for governmental skills in the ghetto allowed Jewish merchants to become first men of Napoleon in Northern Italy, in Modena, and then expanding their leadership um, in, um, in Northern Italy in general as leaders for the Italian Jewry. Yeah, I, I also, I wanted to tease out another important element of the book, which is the, uh, the very careful exploration of spaces. And the book discusses Jewish domestic spaces, sacred spaces, and also pays uh, a lot of attention to the broader urban space of the city with its churches, its streets. And so what, what did it mean for you to think not just about, but also with space? How, how did that the spatial turn in a way in history has informed your work on, on Jewish society in Modena. Yeah, Francesca, thank you. Thank you so much for, for this question, for um, reading so carefully um, my chapters. So I would say that um, I was always intrigued by this sometimes imposition of uh, this public versus private slash domestic. And uh, mm, mm, this idea of having these separate spaces, particularly looking at Jewish history when um, the early modern period uh, progress was not totally convincing me. And for me, what was very interesting was also thinking about, again, not in this, in terms of thinking about Jewish women, for example, instead of just think about, okay, rabbis were trying to confine women, there is this patriarchal attitude. For me, it was very interesting to look through the nuances and see exactly what rabbi meant in order to distinguish between the domestic and the private. And actually, around Berechia Modena, where he was composing these prayers for women, was quite sophisticated. And women chose, in a way, and they refigured. So this is one aspect. Another aspect is a concept, um, um, the idea of liminal spaces, and looking also at the idea of the window, the port, the, 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 the porch as liminal spaces for, society, for the Jewish and Jewish society. And of course, what, so the, the spatial turn by Charlotte von Robert for me has been very um, important. And thinking about how so in some moments you see this uh, community in this ghetto that is inscribed in the Talmudic concept of the roof and the city of Modena is part when uh, the Sabbath Shabbat is coming. Or during the funeral, you see there uh, also the Kabbalistic concept that informed the city of Modena, not only the ghetto because the funeral are made outside, uh, the processions are made outside the city. On the other side, what is also interesting, and um, if you look at, for example, uh, the concept of the window, there are a lot of hilarious moments when basically rabbis and Jewish leaders in Modena are putting under surveillance these young women and boys that through the windows they can uh, um, um, engage, uh, and they, they, they can basically um, become engaged without their, their parents, or attempts of conversion through the windows as well. Um, another aspect that for me was interesting is looking at as um, some early modern historians who work on Venice in particular, um, um, general, in general history thought about the, the how planned communities in uh, the early modern period were always unsuccessful. So a uh, citadels, a uh, fortress, imposed uh, built cities like the city in Palmanova, for example. So the idea of building and imposing a planned community was an unsuccessful aspect. What for me was interesting, actually looking at even if it was inadvertently successful, in Modena, the construction of the gate was in the end a, and the, the negotiation, of course, between the, the, the lay leaders, the rest of the population, the a, a state a, institution was um, 
in the end successful. So bringing this idea that a plan, the ghettos, the ghetto model and probably also other ghettos show that actually in that case, a planned community can be then informed with words and emotions that I trace in my book and was somewhat successful compared to other contexts in early modern Italy and Europe as well. Yeah, yeah, which sort of brings us back to the first question about how to fit modern as ghetto in, in other, uh, in the larger constellation. Um, so wh why don't we talk a little bit about gender, which is such an important uh, category and lens for your book. And, and there's, a, there's a seeming paradox that you trace in the book uh, when it comes to women in the 17th and the 18th century. So on the one hand, you argue and show that elite women disappear from active economic life. Um, among other things, you trace this um, habit, uh, the female practice of renouncing ownership of inherited properties or transferring their dowries um, in which so many women were engaged as a way to protect family capital and pass it down to further generations. But on the other hand, as you were showing in your presentation, Jewish women in Modena organized a female confraternity with unparalleled agency and autonomy, uh, which seems to demonstrate a unique involvement of women in social in the social and charitable sphere. So tell us more about, about this tension. So what, the, what I think is that, uh, mm, and that is actually quite interesting because that is a little bit unique. That is really a little bit unique about Modena. Uh, even if uh, um, actually Francesca Trevellato looking at uh, in her book, uh, she, um, she was mentioning the fact that actually women in Venice in the 18th century had similar behaviors. But if you look at studies in for 17th century Livorno or 16th century Rome or 18th century Turin, here women seems to step down from the control of their properties. What is interesting though, is that actually always, because there is always this negotiation, no traumatic events, in Modena there are always layered levels. And what is interesting for me, for, was for me in, any, in any case, women are uh, needed to declare. So, they, so the, uh, their family members need to have their authorization before the women accept this, uh, this kind of giving up of their properties. What I think here, what we see is a sort of slow, and by the way, here we are talking about upper and middle class Jewish women. Well, actually, if we look at um, lower social status women, women remain active in 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 in, in, in Modena as in the previous centuries. Um, what also is interesting is that there are some silence of women. For example, I'm studying now for my new project all of these textiles made by Jewish women in Venice in the 17th century, where they express their identity, their culture, and I didn't find only one textile from a synagogue where we have a Jewish woman from Modena who put the signature in the 17th and 18th century. And there are many textiles. So there is this, there are these silences in a way. What I think is that there was a sort of process of confining the houses and also in the spaces, how they have to dress. There are all of these codes also, but that are in the book, but also the idea of transforming the domestic sphere in a centripetal and centrifugal place. So there was a tension, but there were also decades of negotiation. So the fact that you are confined, co confined in the house uh, and you are familiar with this kind of strategies of properties and selling and uh, mercantile activities, then the house becomes the center for a philanthropic uh, association with women involved at any level. So these women, for example, they didn't have any doctor because there were some who were taking care of the gynecologist aspect, etc. is a sort of a, a negotiation of opportunities that solved the, the, merge, the emergence of what could have been a public tension that would have destabilized the society. 
I, I have two more questions, um, but I also wanted to mention, we're gonna open the floor to questions from you. So if you want to, uh, if you want to put your name down, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, so my, my next question has to do with the enlightenment and it's uh, not just its influence on the Jews of Modena, but really the role that certain Jewish figures in Modena had as circulators of the enlightenment. Uh, particularly the figure of Mosè Benjamino Foa, fascinating Jewish bookseller and printer was responsible for furnishing the Duke's library with thousands of volumes, including many classics of the Enlightenment. And um, he, together with the other figure that you explore in the last chapter of your book, Moise Formigini, these are such interesting late 18th century Jewish figures. So can you can you tell us more about their roles in shaping the Dutch's cultural profile in and also in in providing um, uh, I assume that um, Moise Benjamin Ofoa, I mean you mentioned it in your book, right? He had he had also his own private library with classics of the Enlightenment and the assumption is that uh, for me, Ginny was able to uh, learn about enlightenment, uh, the enlightenment philosophy by way of these books that were circulating in the duchy. So that tell us more about this really interesting encounter. Yes, Francesca, thank you. So what I would say that here is interesting is starting in the mid 18th century, um, in, the, in the 1770s, 17, 1770s, um, actually. Um, so we have the, we have the Formigines and Moise Formigini and actually his father, Laudadio, and then Moise, who are the ducal silversmith and jewelers. And Moise Benjamino Foa, who is the ducal uh, book seller, basically. And then there is this uh, kind of coincidence of interest between the dukes, the, um, um, the Jesuits who were librarians and the Jews. And the three of them, basically the dukes, Ercole III, et cetera, they were trying to make a sort of resistance in their own um, renovation of the state. The Jesuits were uh, dreaming in a way about having a sort of a Christian society in, on, of which they would have been in control. And Jews were interested in uh, French cultures and mercant um, and basically um, attempts of um, um, importing books that were interesting for the Jewish communities and for the state. So basically, Moise Benjamin of Foa imported books that, by the way, one of the main points is also that many books were, that were prohibited in other Italian states were not prohibited in Modena. So uh, from the Encyclopédie, uh, Dolbach, La Métrie, et cetera. So it's a French-oriented culture, is a broad culture, and Moise Benjamin of Foa is a protagonist of this, uh, of this enterprise. And for sure, what is interesting also is that uh, the tension that sometimes, for example, the Jesuits were working with Formigian and Foa to bring the encyclopedia, and at the same time, they were um, enclosing in the neophyte house uh, Jewish women who didn't want to convert. And there was nothing that the Jewish merchant could do in order to get back this, these women. So this is just uh, an, an example. So what we have here is a sort of, uh, Mm, merchants who are becoming intellectuals and they decided to have this kind of French oriented enlightenment culture. And what Formigini does when he goes to the library of Benjamin of Foa, he composes his speech that I, 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 I analyzed in the last chapter of my book in praising with optimism, the contributions of Jewish merchants into the society. 
And what it does actually is interesting, basically he paraphrase a lot of books from Fritzi and other intellectuals, Voltaire, his polemic with Voltaire, he brings Pinto also into the picture. He's paraphrasing, but what he does that nobody does is that he was doing what he was writing. He was really leading the Jewish society and affirming the, the possibility for Jews to become part of this society. For me, what was interesting, I remember when I read for the first time a Jonathan Karp book that he, when he was analyzing a Luzzatto's, a Simone Luzzatto's a discourse, when Luzzatto was emphasizing in, um, in 1639 that Jews are happy with being just merchants, they are the fit of uh, the body of the society and they are not interested in doing anything else. And and at some point, Jonathan Carr mentioned, okay, but what happened if then these Jews are interested, actually, these merchants are interested in entering? And that is exactly what Formigini does. He looks at, he's so punctilious about French lay culture, the optimism that the Jewish merchants are the best. He envisioned, imagine a community of Jewish merchants. And at the same time, he's also um, pursuing this idea that the laws need to change. The laws will change and Jews will integrate. Yeah, yeah, this is, it's a really fascinating tension. Uh, so my, my last question has to do with the term that you introduced in the book, particularly you use it especially at the, in the first uh, section when you discuss the 17th century and, and it's the, the idea of a culturally intimate communion to talk about the cultural hybridity of modern East Jews. And in, in a way, the historiography on Italian Jewry has, has long emphasized the cultural integration of Jews in Italy, but there have been many different approaches to the theme since, at least since the 1950s. And so as my last question, I wanted to ask you how you see your approach in relation to previous historiographic takes on Italian Jewish acculturation at the time of the ghettos, for instance, uh, that of Robert Bloomfield that talks about a tension between proximity and distance. Yeah, thank you, Francesca. Thank you. And uh, um, I think that, uh, um, of course, uh, I mean, I, um, um, I really enjoyed and I still enjoy uh, all the different positions and uh, more and more, I don't know, by Bonfield, by Ruder, by, by Kenesto, uh, by Stephanie Sigmund, or on uh, different takes of the ghettoization. And uh, I think also that uh, there was, a, if we look at Roberto Bonfield and uh, Joseph Sermoneta before him, I think that for sure there was a reaction against the, this idea of the harmonious interpretation. This idea that Jews were so happy in Italy, there was no tension, there was this immersion in uh, the culture of the others. And on the, on the other end, there was also this idea of uh, um, Jews who are culturated, this kind of acculturation. And I've never been totally satisfied with, with this concept. Actually, it was a Magda Tetter, a colleague, and some of you for sure know her, her that when she was reading my book, I said, well, she, she told me, it, you use acculturation. Isn't that the case that perhaps is a sort of remnant of the idea that we are in the German model, the Ashkala Jews needed to uh, acculturate, etc.? And she was telling me, actually, in your book, you, you, you show something different. So that is why I, I thought that I, I, I started to think and think more. And I thought this idea of cultural hybridization, eh, for as much as resistance can have it in the context of Mexico, for example, etc., I think that for Italian Jews work, work very well. What I think about this idea of the ghetto and uh, let's say, looking at what Bonfield was mentioning with proximity and distance. And I reread, uh, I was telling a friend this morning that I was rereading an article by Bonfield from 1989, when there is exactly this idea, he shaped the idea, first of all, he shaped the idea of the ghetto as a, a place and an imposition that fixed the presence of Jews in the social fabric. And that is absolutely something that enlightened the scholarship. Um, 
what I think that there was in his idea of this these binary categories, private and public, and then the, the Kabbalah that brings all of these changes, but actually the Kabbalah that was shared in, by intellectuals. I think that um, in the opposition that he makes with proximity and distance, and this sort of contrast between the medieval and the modern worlds, I think the point there that was not yet the, um, the category of the early modern period, the early modern Jewry as conceived. And I remember uh, um, a review by David Ruderman of a book by an Italian historian, Anna Foa, that was making a synthesis of Jews in Europe. And she was often bringing this category of reformation, of, sorry, Renaissance and Baroque. And for, in that review was the first time that actually there was, for me at least, the idea of, wait a minute, here we need to go beyond these categories and think about the early modern period as, as a whole. I think that our, so my book and in general, our generation is, has embraced this kind of studying the particular, the context, the local context, but thinking in a larger way, and then even uh, so defining the early modern jury and now defining the early modern world in a comparative and global perspective. So the refugees are back. So in a way, I think that we have different uh, approaches and my book shows different approaches in this kind of uh, going more in a broader perspective. And mm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> From this perspective, it's not done because it was not done before. It's just because our, our questions changed. Of course, of course. So I see already two people that have questions. I see Federico Dalbo and Robert Jute, and then I also see now Sandra Gambetti. Uh, so Federico, please. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I was late, but I got my um, third vaccine, so I had to come a little late. Uh, so I enjoyed very, very much the the, the fragment of your conference and I've um, sneaked into your book so I haven't read it yet but I'm looking forward to do that because uh, doing that because uh, it is going to resonate with many things I'm trying to do in this time my question is and um, <clears throat> again it pertains again the gender studies uh, issues that were so interesting and you began to discuss during this presentation of the book um, um, I happen to, 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 to work on uh, Mordechai Dato just a little and uh, of, um, sometime, I don't remember, remember when, I published something on, on um, his versification of uh, Megillat Esther. So he says that actually it, he, he used, I come to the point, he used to, um, he was trying to, to write a commentary on on, uh, uh, on um, a mystical commentary on Esther, and then somehow he changed his mind, and eventually he wrote a versification into uh, Judeo-Italian for women. Oh. Um, and I remember, if I <clears throat> remember correctly, that you mentioned a relative of Mordechai Dato who got uh, uh, converted and made uh, big fuzz, so he tried to yeah, you know, the usual, he tried to as a mishumad to, to, to interfere with the Jewish life, and to provoke some incidents. So the question is, I'm wondering if there is also somehow a kind of connection in between the idea that um, um, uh, people like Mordechai Dato, so the Jewish intellectual at the time, tended to expand it to um, a broader theological and doctrinal uh, environment. So they tried to expand on these on these issues to try to be so sticked and so strict with the Kabbalah, for instance. So they tried to just to give a more agreeable and uh, general understanding of what Judaism is, so it's not something Zoharic and Kabbalistic pointed to the idea that we, we can have in the Messias. Um, and so if there is a connection between this idea of popularizing Jewish culture, openness to women, because anyhow, Mordechai Dato was interested in, in educating women, so he, the versification was for women who could learn enjoy poetry, enjoy uh, literature somehow, and then eventually got educated about what uh, Megillat de Serre actually is. So if there is a connection all between these things and eventually the conversion to Christianity. So if this openness to gender studies, so this sensibility 
to women and women education in the end didn't result into somehow uh, so to say bringing yourself outside the pyramid of Judaism because um, we know that Jewish, uh, Jewish law has many issues with uh, patriarchalism and um, heteronormativity and all these kind of things so I'm asking you if you think is with a trend uh, in, in this society, in the Northern Italian societies, in this direction. <coughs> and last question, if you can tell, uh, <coughs> sorry, if you can tell me something more about the book that, um, what's his name? Uh, this relative was was mentioning. If, do you think that the, um, what's his name? Sorry, I forgot the, the I remember that you, you spoke about the, the relative of uh, Mother Hayato and you said that he was, um, mentioning a text that he Mordechai Lato was uh, transcribing has transcribed and I'm wondering if he was referring to some of his unpublished works about it but this is a small question the main question is if you think there is a connection between open up to new issues and new sensibility for women and then eventually being so progressive that you actually convert thank you thank you thank you uh, what I would say here that actually in what you are mentioning on uh, um, the idea of using the Kabbalah in, in terms of popularization and uh, um, educating women and producing works or sermons for women. Actually here, you can see, I think, how uh, the, the case of Jews in Modena actually is uh, tell us that and confirms that some trends that are proper to, if we want to also assess the early modern Jewry in the light of gender and Jewish women, I think that these elements that you emphasize are part of a, a, a larger discourse in European communities, European Jewish communities. So for example, in a recent chapter, Elisheva Karabach and Debra Kaplan were talking about the, the culture of writing and how the culture of writing, the printing impacted, uh, impacted um, Jew Jewish women's literacy. Um, in, in, not, in, in, in basically in con considering different uh, social classes. What I would say here that, uh, um, so just to give an example, when you're talking about uh, the education of women. So there were also some uh, texts that were composed and published for women, such as the Seder Mitzvot that, that I mentioned, they were sort of part of a global education of Jewish women in, in communities. What I think here is that, and including the Kabbalah in, um, and in using the Kabbalah to educate in women, uh, I think is a part of, is, is a phenomenon that we see also in Yiddish and, and not only in Judeo-Italian. So that is for sure that if we want to map the early modern period, uh, Modena and other contexts can uh, be useful. What I would say that in my opinion was particularly interesting regarding the, uh, the conversion is that uh, um, what is particular and interesting, or maybe perhaps it's not just particular, it's just that I had the opportunity to look at sources that uh, open this kind of uh, um, pictures on uh, the Jewish society and the book reading culture. I think that what is very interesting here is that the culture is in common, um, but the theological boundaries are really neat. So what is here interesting, and I don't see, um, I don't see a, a, a tendency of Jewish women a, as potential um, convert to Christianity because of these elements. Because I think that in a way there was a, this society had this uh, characteristic of uh, a, being totally immersed in a, a, in a, in a, in a, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Christian and secular of the time culture, etc. But theological boundaries were very rarely crossed. So that is my, my take on. Uh, the next question is from Robert Jute. 
Uh, hi, Federica. Congratulations on your new book and also to uh, on uh, your promotion to associate professor. My question is a rather short one. It's really also not very pertinent to the core of your book, but you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that uh, also other marginal groups uh, were in the city and, and you mentioned the prostitutes. So is there any a, a similar ghettoization of prostitutes as we have in Venice in the 15th century where we were concentrated uh, in one place near the Rialto Bridge? Uh, yes, Robert, thank you, and thank you for being here. Uh, mm, uh, yes, actually. What is interesting is that we have uh, in Modena a sort of uh, internal exiles, and uh, um, so you have prostitutes who are confined in, in an area not so far away from the ghetto, actually, and the community of sick that are also um, hospitalized in a way. And you see also the, uh, what is very interesting is also you see a lot of attention on uh, uh, independent women who are leaders of uh, um, Christian communities, the, the Sante Vive, the Begin, the, et cetera, um, in association with Jesuits. So these women also, there is this need of, uh, um, um, in a way of confine them to, um, um, so absolutely, there is, a, there is a, this kind of um, um, phenomenon. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Robert. And uh, Sandra Gambetti is next. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, a premise, uh, this question comes from a non-specialist in the field, so it can be a, bit, a little bit general, but um, um, uh, Federica, you um, explain your work in terms of uh, modernist Jewelry. And from time to time, you specify that you talk about um, Sephardi uh, members of the Jewish community. Uh, but um, as far as I understand, the Jewish community in Modena was diversified. There, were Sephardi there was a Sephardi community, an Ashkenazi community, and the community of Italian right. So my question is, uh, when all these three subgroups participating in equal measure in the commercial, in the economic and intellectual uh, movement that you are explaining in your book. My second question is about whether what you explain about the intellectual um, interest of these um, uh, people, women, first and more foremost, has any connection with the collection of uh, the Hebrew and Jewish manuscripts that are present in the Biblioteca Estense. It's a very important uh, collection that was reevaluated by Ernesto Milano a couple of decades ago. And the third is a kind of uh, comment, short comments about the happiness of being in the ghetto and flourishing. And I want to remind you that the ghetto uh, was gated. There were gates in the ghetto that were closed by the authority at dawn and reopened at dusk. So I was wondering if this uh, may actually mitigate, this detail may actually mitigate the idea of general happiness and integration uh, of the Jews in Modena in the period that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So just that I never mentioned the word happiness <laughs> regarding ghettoization. And actually my book is built exactly in showing a permanent level of negotiation with the authorities. And uh, uh, for, just to give an example, as soon, so the, the, inquisi the inquisitors um, were proactive in pushing for ghettoization. In the moment in which in 1638, the ghettoization was reached and the ghetto was established, in a way we see a sort of waning of attempts by the inquisitors to um, interfere and to put under surveillance Jews. But one in a sort of how can it to explain for Rome, even if in a different level. So once the community is ghettoized, there is this idea of going easier for fishing for converts. And exactly at that point in after 1638, the neophyte house is becoming um, an institution with the funds and becomes more and more aggressive. So um, 
again, the fact that I mentioned the fact there is a cultural hybridity, but there is a ghettoization. There are negotiation and, the, the, and there are theological boundaries that are really clear. So it's uh, just to correct the, here the perception. Regarding the three communities, what I think is here is again, a process that uh, Kenesto and others, but Kenesto in particular, show for Rome. So we, we, all of these communities actually amalgamated quite easily. So that is quite interesting, how the communities amalgamated quite easily in Modena as well. Even more, what I see here is that yes, there were communities with different, with different minahim, with minagim, with different customs, educational endeavors, etc. But what I think actually here is particular in Modena compared to Venice, for example, is that the, the ghetto is the community. So his, what is very interesting here is that there is this, in, in, a, in a different way, there is a surveillance of, of the merchants, but there is a negotiation with the Jewish law, for example, for women finding new solutions for girls who have been impregnated by the co-workers or the, or the householders or the idea of finding solution for Jewish women that otherwise would have been uh, expelled in other communities as uh, um, il um, mm, barriers of illicit children, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, this aspect. While, for example, for me, in my new project in Venice, what I see is that actually the community is uh, um, under the Jewish roof. There where you see really the mingling while the different communities in Venice maintain a different, different characteristics and divisions. Regarding the interest of women in the Bibliotheca Estense, yes, absolutely, there is a rich collection of, uh, of manuscripts and uh, I also use some in my book. And uh, um, what is interesting is that these area, Modena and Ferrara, is where actually some books and were copied by Farisol, Abraham Farisol, women were requesting these books, they were asking for having a prayer instead of reciting the blessing of uh, in the morning, thank God for making me according to your will, the prayers were thank, thank you God for making me a woman, and uh, what we see though is that rabbis in the 17th century are actually, such as Aron Berechia Modena, are actually bringing back the idea, oh, wait a minute, these prayers book are not okay. But, but absolutely, the, uh, um, the, the collection of Bibliothek Estense is, uh, is quite rich and I use it um, in, 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 my book, in my work as well. Thank you. So we, we do have still three questions. Uh, so I'm gonna just ask for your patience. We're gonna go until 11.40, if that's okay. And of course, if you need to get off the call at 11.30, uh, we understand, but we will have to end at 11.40. Uh, and so we have three questions. There's Kenneth Stowe, Baruch Lev Kelman, and Joshua Johnson. If you can please keep your questions brief so that Federica can have a chance to answer all of you. Kenneth, please. Okay, thank you, Fefe. The, the, the book has is, is been, you know, I've been following it for a few years and you research for even longer. And it, it's really uh, a step forward. Uh, I, I wanted to, to comment uh, uh, in, in terms of expressions like, like acculturation or hybridity or whatever. Maybe today I would call a book Dialogue of the Dialogues because the, the, the essence is that there's constant dialogue between the Jewish community and the, the non-Jewish community, work that I'm doing right now on meat provision in the ghetto. Without dialogue, it just doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Uh, and and the, the same really in the past, uh, if we want to use a term like acculturation, uh, why not? It doesn't mean assimilation. It means being part of the society. Yet at the same time, I think it's very important to point out that every Jewish community is different. What, what Stephanie's found for Florence is one thing. What you found for Modena is not another. Venice, as you're now discovering and others have seen, it, it's something else. Rome is unique. You say, uh, what about Renaissance culture? Well, what Renaissance culture is there in Rome? Uh, there just isn't that much. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a clerical culture. It's a, it's, it's a legal culture. And their Jews are fitting in. Uh, 
but of course, let's not forget Tranquilo Corcos. Interestingly, at the at the at the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century, and Sermoneta showed that he was not alone in this. So there is some of this, and and I think that and and oh, just a, a final comment in terms of force and the, the brutality of the cousin Catacumini, which. Uh, Ana Del Monte's diary, which of course is more Tranquilo's diary as, as it's formed and presented and they're, they're self-fashioning, it's Tranquilo. Uh, the, the, that, that, that represents an enormous bulk. I found 23 cases of women uh, pushed into, uh, forced into the Casa de Catacumini in a brief period in the middle of the 18th century. So how many of these, these women were there? Tons that we don't even know about. So. Uh, again, I don't want to just keep going. Uh, I've been told to shut up, uh, so I will. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's so many marvelous open questions, and including finally the last the business about changing law. As the whole point of Anand Tranquilo is, Tranquilo is screaming, there's a French Revolution, an American Revolution. Why are we living the way we are in the ghetto, being forced to have women taken to the Casa Catecumen? Thank you. I'm finished. Fefe, where are you? I thought that we uh, we gather all the three questions. We can go, we can do that. Yeah, we can do the the gathering style. Uh, so next, the next question then would be from Baruch Lev Kelman, and then Federica, you can just you know pick whichever element from the three questions to to answer. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, considering as you just mentioned, Bonfils reactionary approach, um, and also considering gender, uh, I was wondering what your take on Bonefield's kind of uh, downplaying of um, women's roles, for example, with Shechita and characters like Diana Modena, Fioretta Modena, if you have any response to that. And uh, Joshua Johnson, please. Thank you, Dr. Francoshoni and Dr. Bergoli for hosting this. Uh, my question is really just revolving around um, the motivation for the Deste family for um, tolerating and allowing Jewish presence in Ferrara and Modena. In my research, I examined Ferrara as, um, in my thesis, I examined Ferrara and looked at it as um how tolerant the dukes were for, for for jews in the city as and jonathan israel made that point in his book um i i examined a specific figure emmanuel uh sorry emmanuel termelio emmanuel termelius and i accounted for his conversion to um christianity and specifically his philo-semitism he never wrote um, any anti-Semitic tracts against Jews as many uh, other converts had done. And I attributed his philo-Semitism to his upbringing in Ferrara. And so since uh, the, the, the Este family were the Dukes of both Ferrara and Modena, wh why do you think the Dukes were tolerant of Jews? Um, do you think the presence of Jewish merchants in the Este duchies motivated the Dukes to tolerate Jews? Thank you. Uh, I see that Stephanie, you also have a question. Can, if you can please tell your question in less than a minute so that Federica can have a few minutes to answer. Um, Abs <clears throat> absolutely. Um, the question is, um, and I have to say, I haven't read your book and I'm blown away by, um, so writing this up, I'm blown away by the number of ideas that you've brought us. I'm just so in awe, and I really want to thank you. Just can't wait to read it. Um, really am. Um, my question has to do with periodization and women's history. And I'm really interested in what you say um, or what you might think as I struggle always to revise my teaching. Um, I'm not sure periodization matters anymore, but we're all within the early modern. But I am interested if it matters to you when the first organizations, when the first organizations of uh, sororities, confraternité, um, compagnie of women 
um, come up because, you know, it, yeah, to, to what extent does that matter um, to you? And how does it help us understand what's going on in Modena? Thanks. Thank you all. So I, I, I will, um, uh, Kenneth, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, I totally agree with the fact that in any case, also regarding acculturation, we change, we change attitude um, um, and terminology. And I, I totally share what you said in terms of dialogue and not dialogue. And Joshua, I will uh, get you back on, uh, uh, on, on, on the thing of Ferrara and model. I just want to, to, in the two minutes that we have to, Stay, to actually look a little bit about a um, Bonfils approach that actually I would not define a re reactionary approach. I think that, um, mm, first of all, there is, a, this, I, there is this fact that um, everybody and every school of historians has a story. So I think that in Bonfil uh, points, sometimes there was also a sort of anti-colonialism uh, 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 attempts of uh, bringing back the attention on the Hebrew sources uh, and making it what he called an internal history and an internal perspectives. And uh, actually, I just wrote a, a, a chapter on the history of Jewish women in early modern Italy. And actually, if you look at how in some works, uh, Bonfil talks about uh, female agency in Mantua in the 16th century, is quite uh, actually a, a challenging and quite relevant for this idea of seeing women who were allowed to navigate through spheres and in the domestic sphere, sometimes they were allowed to do things that were not so um, um, common for, uh, uh, for um, uh, the Jewish female world in general. What I would say, uh, Stephanie, thank you for uh, thank you for your uh, for your question. I think that fraternalism, if we can use this terminology from the early modern world, is quite important. And I think also that there is this kind of different phases of fraternalism of women in the early modern period that can actually, you are absolutely right in thinking about periodization. Because what I see is that, for example, the Nestarim confraternity in Bologna in, the, in 1516 was have a separate chapter for women and an autonomous chapter. You can see the same thing in the, in, in, at the same time in Lugo, for example, because you know all the sources are scattered and we don't have a complete pink, pink asim, et etc. So what I would say is that this, uh, how women enter or not entered in, or were not admitted in Jewish confraternities. For example, in Livorno in the 17th century, they were admitted in the, the confraternities for dowries. It's quite important in seeing how they were negotiating their role in the society. And I think that what I see is that in the 17th century, it can be Modena, it can be elsewhere. There is an, at, at the beginning of the 17th century, there is an attempt of bring a Jewish women under control and often women are or in only female Jewish confraternity and very rarely are admitted with men in the same confraternity. So that is also one aspect that we look at in terms of what is their membership. They are only in this confraternity for dowries. They are only, oh, as you did for, for Florence, I'm sorry, forgot. I, I always I, I cite you when you were finding the, the Society of Women for Florence. So what we're doing is that it was just dowry or there were also some other activities and they were admitted with men as in Venice in the second part of the 17th century. I'm um, sorry, is that a question? Um, um, they had two separate societies. No, no, it was just a comment in any case. Yeah, that I found very useful, yeah. I, I want to, unfortunately, we have to bring this to an end. We're out of time, but I think all the questions show the interest in your work, Federica. And although I don't get a commission from Penn Press, I have been putting in the chat several codes so that you can get the, the book. Uh, let me show it to you again. It's such a, it's such a beautiful book, beautiful cover. And uh, um, you can actually get it with a better discount, a 40% discount, because Penn Press is running a holiday sale right now. So do that, read it. It's a, it's a tremendous contribution to the field of early modern 
uh, Italian Jewish history and early modern Jewish history uh, more broadly. So thank you so much, Federica, for your presentation. Thank you so much to all of you that are still here for coming today. Um, and um, I wish you a very happy rest of your Friday and hopefully see you soon at another event of the Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Center. Take care, everybody. <laughs>